Hey everyone, and welcome to a new series I'm starting on my channel. In this series, I will be talking about the lore and importance of each party member's starting persona throughout every single Persona game. In the Persona games, the starting personas of your party hold great meaning to the character and draw parallels to the individual throughout the game. I've always appreciated the thought that went into deciding the best mythological or historical figure that was suited to the party members you will be spending your adventure with. This series aims to explain the importance of these choices. In this video, we'll be going in-depth over Persona 5's cast of playable characters and their unique starting personas. Also, a special guest starring in every video. Stay tuned! What better way to kick things off than the main character himself, Joker. Joker's starting persona is Arsène. Arsène is based off the fictional gentleman burglar Arsène Lupin. Arsène is a character created by French author Maurice Leblanc. Sound familiar? in 1905, published in the magazine Je Sais Tout. Throughout his depictions, Arsène is shown as a man on the side of good, operating on the wrong side of the law. The character itself is a con man Robin Hood type figure that steals from the rich and benefits the poor. While he stands alone in some publications, he is also amused to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's character Sherlock Holmes. Arsène is non-violent when dealing with the law enforcement, but often pranks and misdirects them, a perfect counterpart to Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Lupin is an obvious connection to Joker and the gentleman thief archetype. They even talk about it in the game. Joker is the main character, so a lot of his actions will be determined by you, but there are some constants I can tie back to. The idea of changing the world with less than legal means, and a tendency to burglarize those conveying unjust power fits both these characters to a T. The design of Arsène is obviously not very true to the source material, considering Arsène was meant to be a normal man, but is interesting nonetheless. The clothing worn by the persona is reminiscent of depictions of Arsène with the top hat, black suit and white ruffles, as well as the red overcoat and waist-high red boots being a little less true to Lupin. The other more demonic attributes of his design, such as the horns and black wings, are most likely to segue nicely into his awakened state, Satanayo. Ryuji Sakamoto, everyone's favorite blonde boy bro. His persona is Captain Kidd. Captain Kidd, also known as William Kidd, was a Scottish-born privateer and pirate. William Kidd was a member of an English-French pirate crew sailing the Caribbean and mutinied against his captain to become the leader. Once in control of a ship now named the Blessed William, a bit arrogant, huh? He sailed to the island of Nevis to protect it from the French and because he knew the governor there. Once there, they were promptly told they would not be paid for their defensive services, but that their payment would come from the French. Wink wink. Captain Kidd then spent a good portion of his life looting French settlements and ships. After a good long while of very pirate-like behavior, his crew became more than a little savage. There were accounts of torture, but Captain Kidd was furious at his crew and forced him to return most of the stolen goods after he found out. Later, after accidentally sacking a neutral ship, the Royal Navy was to subject the crew to impressment, which is an old-timey way of saying drafting them into the army. Rather than let them do that, however, Captain Kidd escaped with his crew late into the night and resumed his pirate-like behavior, but this time, not fooling anybody. Ryuji Sakamoto is written to have a good amount of similarities to this historical figure in personality and general demeanor. Both characters display outwardly aggressive mannerisms and are branded by what people perceive them as. For Ryuji, he's branded a delinquent despite his very caring nature and a willingness to put himself in harm's way to protect those he cares for, and Captain Kidd branded as a pirate despite displaying consistent morality and belief in helping his country. Prior to Captain Kidd's execution, he was prompted to name his accomplices and implicate them, but he refused, in spite of their not intervening on his behalf. This sentiment mirrors a quote that Ryuji says, Someone treating you like dirt doesn't give you the right to do the same to them. Captain Kidd's design is pretty much what you'd expect from a personified historical figure. Standard black trousers and boots with a blue privateer's coat. His chest is inlaid with two scimitars attached to chained anchors and a pirate captain's hat with a Jolly Roger motif rests upon his eye patch wearing skull head. Kidd's cannon arm, crimson cape, and mini flying ship I find particularly charming as well. I'd recommend stealing his look. Morgana, the schedule-keeping cat. His persona is Zorro. Yes, THE Zorro, fictional character created by Johnston McCulley in 1919. Set in the Spanish occupation of the municipality of Los Angeles around the time of 1769 to 1821. 
a masked vigilante defending commoners and indigenous people of California against the corrupt rulers and general villainy. Often depicted in all-black attire and a signature rapier, Zorro's true identity is Don Diego de la Vega, son of Alejandro de la Vega, a wealthy landowner in California and his mother having passed away in his earlier years. Diego learned his swordsmanship in Spain while at university, but was called back to California by his father to learn about his home falling into the hands of a tyrannical dictator. Upon learning this revelation, Zorro was born. Diego lives in a large estate, with many secret passages and even a cave which serves as a base of operations and a hiding place for his favorite horse, Tornado. In Diego's non-Zorro activities, he hides his martial skill by pretending to be a coward. With that brief description alone, there can be many ties back to Morgana. First appearing as a masked bipedal cat, whose first instinct is to help those unfortunate enough to have found themselves in Kamoshida's torture castle. While in the real world, he appears to be an average house cat, in the metaverse, he is a confident swordsman. The theme of rebellion is obviously mirrored by Zoro, and Morgana trying to find his homeland can be related to Diego's aim of regaining his homeland from tyranny. Also, the fact that Zoro's favorite horse is named Tornado might be why Morgana uses wind magic in the game. Zoro's design in Persona 5, aside from the proportions, is the most realistic portrayal of the source material in the game. Clad in leather pants, cape, riding boots, and blouse, with leather gloves and a flat-brimmed hat also serving as Zoro's signature mask. His waist is adorned by an ornate leather Z belt buckle. Yes, I'm Canadian, so I say Z. Most likely in reference to the fact that Zoro would carve the letter Z into his fallen enemies' bodies with his rapier as a mark of his work. On to Kamaki, a lover's arcana favorite. Her persona is Carmen. Carmen is a novella written by Prosper Mary May, with the titular Carmen as the main character written in 1845. Carmen is a textbook example of a femme fatale, using her beauty to take advantage of those foolish enough to trust her. In the story, Jose Lizara Bengao, I think that's how you say it, was working as a guard in a cigar factory when he met a worker there named Carmen. Jose found her carving X's into another worker's face after a fight and arrested her, only to release her after being sweet-talked by Carmen. Jose's superiors found out about this and subsequently arrested and demoted him. After his release, Carmen came to reward him with a few nights of bliss. I think you know what that means. From then on, Jose was head over heels for Carmen and allowed her band of smugglers to pass by his guard post unhindered. One day though, Jose went looking for Carmen and while in her home, she entered with his very own lieutenant. He didn't take that very well and provoked a fight that ended in the lieutenant's death. Jose then fled with Carmen's band of outlaws. From spending so much time with the band, he slowly realized Carmen would use her beauty to entice anyone for the benefit of her band, and that she was married. Jose, once again, mad with jealousy, stabbed Carmen's husband to death and took her as his wife. Now, as I'm sure you all know, you can't solve all your problems with wanton murder, so Carmen told him that she loved him less than before and that murdering everyone she liked wasn't very cool. Jose begged her to flee with him and start an honest life but she said she knew he was fated to kill her and that Carmen will always be free. Then, in typical Jose fashion, he stabbed her to death too. Wow, pretty heavy stuff and not too similar to Persona 5 on the surface, but let's try to tie it back. Carmen was most likely chosen to represent Ahn due to her looks being one of her most defining features. Ahn struggles to come to terms with the fact that many people will only see her as a pretty face, but never loses conviction in her goals as a phantom thief. For the entirety of Persona 5, she holds great passion for the big picture of the Phantom Thieves and helping the world is her number one priority. In the novella, Carmen does anything necessary to maintain the safety of her criminal band, as well as thinking far into the future and using the knowledge beneath her outward beauty. Carmen, depicted in the game, wears a very low-cut frilly red dress reminiscent of Spanish and Romani design. Hearts dot her corset and thigh-high high heel shoes with a rose belt connecting her two servants by their thorny stem. A panther mask covers her face, and she is shown smoking a cigar in reference to where Jose first met her in the cigar factory in the novella. What's up everyone, David here, and I'm here today recording a clip for my boy Tony for you who asked me to submit a clip actually of me describing and explaining who's my favorite Persona 5 character and why, and what's his story. And today I chose to talk about Yusuke because he's definitely one of the more interesting characters in Persona 5 in my opinion. So today I am taking a few minutes to talk about Yusuke Kitagawa and his persona Goemon. So if you don't know, Yusuke is the funny guy in Persona 5. Hey, uh, 
since it's just us guys in here, let me ask you. Girls dancing. Pretty hot, right? Don't tell me. Have you been leering at Futaba during her routines? The one who was a bit savage. That's enough. You're disgracing your yukata. You should be more aware of your womanhood. The one who was awkward at times. Yeah, this one. Apologies, but I was entranced. The moment I set eyes on this distinct shape, I was in love. This Yosuke. <laughs> His persona is definitely my favorite one from Persona 5, it's Goemon. And actually, if you don't know, Goemon is a very interesting figure from Japanese history. Hishikawa Goemon was initially interpreted very differently from a story to another. Some said he was born a samurai and others said that he was only a thief. But the most common thing that we hear from him in the books is that he's a courageous man who lived a life of anger and greed. Some even call him the Japanese Robin Hood, and the reason for that is actually very interesting and impressive in my opinion. He was known for stealing from the rich people in town and giving back what he stole to the poor. In 1973, the man lost both his parents to the ends of a party of the Japanese government, Ashikaga Shogunate. Excuse my pronunciation. Ashiga Shogunate is the leading military institution during the Muromachi period of Japanese history. In other words, from 1336 to 1573. All of that happened when he was only 15 years old. Ishikawa Goemon lived his whole life training martial arts and ninjutsu and looking for revenge. It was no easy task. It's with the assistance of Momochi Sandayu, the man who adopted him, that he was able to gain a lot of skills as a martial art artist. Once he mastered those skills, he finally did it. He tried to kill a Japanese lord who goes by the name of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. You heard me right, he tried. Because on this day, Goemon failed and he was sentenced to death, but not any normal death. He was dropped with his own son in a boiling chaldron. The last thing that this remarkable hero did before dying is that he held his son in the air in the boiling chaldron. This is probably the most common picture uh, and painting that we can see of him while researching on him online it's probably his most iconic mom moment of his life his death holding his son in the air so kind of a sad story but i still think it was extremely unique and interesting now in persona 5 yusuke kitagawa unveils his persona goemon when he finds out the truth about his master and tutor madarame the first thing that hits with the lore behind Goemon and Yusuke's story is the desire for revenge and the extremely high level of anger in regards to the man who was supposed to be his model. Goemon's design in the game is by far my favorite but because of how unique he looks, plus his face, or more precisely the paintings on his face, references his Yukiyo-hi painting since Yusuke's character was inspired by a Japanese painter named Utamaro Kitagawa, who was also a Nuki Yohi painter. And Yuki Hohi is actually a style of heart that you're, you've been seeing since the beginning of this video. It's Japanese paintings. So, yes, there's the Robin Hood, Japanese Robin Hood reference with Goemon, but there's also the paintings on his face that most people don't know, then I thought was super interesting. That's it for my clip. I hope that it gave you a good idea of who's Yusuke Kitagawa and why he's my favorite character, and also the unfortunate story of. Ishikawa Goemon, his persona. Makoto Nijima, the book smart badass. Her persona is Johanna. Johanna is based off Johannes Angelicus, a legendary woman who disguised herself as a man and rose through the ranks of the Catholic Church to eventually become the Pope. Which is something that may or may not have actually happened. Either way, there are many accounts of Joan's story, but for the purpose of this video, I will be taking the source of the Chronicum Pontificum et Imperatorum by Martin Opava. In this account, Joan went by the name of John after being led to Athens dressed as a man by her lover. In Athens, she spent her time learning the branches of knowledge until she had no equal, and after her schooling she went to Rome where she taught liberal arts and even had some great masters come to see her speak. Joan's reputation began to precede her, and after some time, she was chosen to become the Pope. Unfortunately, while she was the Pope, Joan became pregnant and gave birth during a procession, which then led to her death. The street Joan perished in was later known as the Shunned Street, and it is said that is where she was buried. Joan was wiped from the papacy's historical records, and the Lord Pope turns aside his head every time he passes the street. While not particularly a religious figure, there are many parallels one could draw to Makoto. Makoto, while being the student president, is very unpopular and has very little self-worth. 
Only after donning her persona's mask does she really begin to fight for what she believes in. Becoming a phantom thief allows her highly analytical mind to flourish as she takes a pseudo-leadership position in the battles. She views the phantom thieves as a tool to dispense justice, and isn't above a little subterfuge in enabling her to do what is right. Johanna as depicted in the game is... a motorcycle. Mm, very unique. Johanna is a sleek metallic motorcycle with a woman's face on the front. I believe they went with this design to represent Pope Joan's inability to show much of herself aside from her face, so as not to reveal her true identity. The face's more or less androgynous features and peaceful look could somewhat give off a holy, almost angelic vibe as well. Also, Pope Joan is a very common character used to depict the Priestess Tarot card, which is Makoto's specific arcana. Futaba Sakura, Hermit Savant. Her persona is Necronomicon. The Necronomicon is an outlier, as it is not one particular historical or mythological figure, but the magical grimoire Book of the Dead. The Necronomicon was mentioned in the short story The Hound, written by H.P. Lovecraft in 1922, but the exact origins of the Necronomicon are unknown. For the sake of this video, I will be using the Lovecraft mythos. The Necronomicon, as accounted in the posthumously released book, History of the Necronomicon, was originally called Al-Azif, an Arabic word Lovecraft defined as the nocturnal sound, the howling of demons. Very SMT. The contents of the book are mostly unknown, but it can be extrapolated that it holds ancient cosmic knowledge that has the potential to drive those who read it mad, in true Lovecraft fashion. The Necronomicon is also translated as the Book of the Dead, and could possibly be a necromantic tome used to communicate with the deceased. There is so much to say about the Necronomicon, the Lovecraft mythos runs deep, but I will leave it at that for now and try to relate it back to Futaba. When you first meet Futaba, she is in a sorry state, suffering from suicidal depression and even hallucinations. She sees herself as mentally dead, and deserving of it as well. Her palace is an Egyptian pyramid filled with ancient chambers with names like Chamber of Regret and Chamber of Guilt. Futaba, in her delusions, does nothing but fill her mind with knowledge, while not of the ancient forbidden kind, definitely esoteric to many. The famous rhyming couplet attributed to the author of the Necronomicon states, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Through the strange power of the phantom thieves, Futaba's yearning for death may die. Somewhat ironically, Futaba can only use the vast knowledge she acquired while suffering from this psychosis after her will to live is rekindled. The Necronomicon in the game is represented by a UFO which picks up Futaba with very Cthulhu-like tentacles in reference to Lovecraft. The outside is adorned with green markings with some battery and smartphone motifs and a gargoyle statue on the top. The inside of the Necronomicon is an empty abyss Futaba floats in with words and numbers flying by only she can understand. A UFO is fitting for what can be seen as alien knowledge. Very cool. Haru Okumura, the Sadistic Empress. Her persona is Milady. Milady is in reference to Milady de Winter, a fictional character in Alexandre Dumas's book The Three Musketeers. Milady is described in the book as being a tall, fair-haired, beautiful woman with a voice that can bewitch anyone. Under the exterior is an intelligent French spy passing as a native English woman, remorseless in her actions and ruthlessly accomplishes her goals. As a nun at the age of 16, Milady seduced a priest to steal the church's sacred vessels to finance a new life elsewhere in the country. They were then caught and sentenced to death, but Milady seduced the jailer's son to escape. The executioner happened to be the priest's brother and blamed Milady for leading his brother to criminality. He branded her with the same fleur-de-lis symbol given to criminals at the time. The priest afterward escaped as well and fled with Milady to a small town. The owner of the land then became captivated by her beauty and married her, giving her his wealth and title. One day, while she was out hunting with her husband, Milady falls off her horse and faints. Her husband, the landowner, cuts away her clothes so she can breathe, only to discover the convict's brand and filled with rage has her hanged from a tree. The landowner searches for Milady's brother who had married them, but he is nowhere to be found not knowing that the brother and Milady were the same person. Milady somehow survives her hanging and flees to Paris, where she marries into English nobility and the husband mysteriously dies shortly after the marriage. Throughout the book, the musketeers mount evidence against Lady de Winter, leading to her eventual execution. There are similarities between Milady and Carmen in both being femme fatales and manipulating those around them for personal gain. Milady, after being branded, is forced to obfuscate the truth of her origins and survive by any means. 
Haru can be seen throughout the game being forced into situations where she loses her sense of self. Her trust issues are worthy of note, as she has no friends up to that point in the story solely relying on others to make decisions for her. Once she awakens to her powers though, she casts aside being a subservient puppet and afterwards shows signs of being quite sadistic in her approach to people's liberation, showing Milady really is a better fit for Haru than Carmen as a femme fatale. Maybe if Haru was to marry her fiancé, he would turn up mysteriously dead as well. <laughs> Milady is an invisible figure wearing a late Baroque-style pink and black dress with sleeves to her elbows and long pink gloves covering her hands. The base of the dress is emblazoned with a golden floral pattern and a pair of lips in the center of the seam right below a dagger. Milady is also holding a black fur-lined fan and a pink mask being the only thing that's representing her face, with yellow eyes reminiscent of the shadow world. When attacking, the seam on her dress opens, revealing cannons behind that golden mouth. Symbolism is pretty clear on that one. Her invisibility conveys the common occurrence of Milady assuming different identities. Overall, a great design. Goro Akechi, the Psycho Detective. Now, spoiler warning, I won't be talking about Robin Hood for this one. His true persona is Loki. Loki is a Norse trickster god, sometimes helping the other gods and sometimes acting maliciously towards them. He can shapeshift into any creature, which he uses to his advantage in orchestrating convoluted schemes for or against the wishes of his kin. Loki is the father of Hel, goddess of the underworld, Fenrir, wolf of Ragnarok, Jormungandr, the world serpent, and even mother of Slepnir, the eight-legged horse. Yeah, shapeshifting is weird. In the poetic Edda, there are many stories involving Loki, but I'll share one I find particularly interesting. Loki and the other gods are drinking together, and Loki is insulting the guests there. The other guests are praising the host servers, and Loki can't stand hearing it, kills one of them out of anger, only to be driven out by the other gods into the woods. Loki comes out of the woods and meets Eldir, and demands to know what they're talking about back inside of the party. Eldir says they're talking about weapons and war, you know, typical Norse stuff, and some not-so-friendly things about Loki. He then devises a plan to mix their mead with malice, turning them against each other just as much as Loki. This ends up getting Loki into a lot of trouble as he enters back into the party, but not after chewing out almost every single god there. While Loki was a god in Norse mythology, his father was a giant, and Loki was the god's ultimate undoing. Goro Akechi is akin to Loki in many ways. Loki and Akechi are both cursed children of evil fathers. Akechi is an eccentric, deceitful man using any means necessary to appear competent and worthy of praise. Akechi and Joker's relationship even somewhat mirrors Loki and Thor's relationship with the enviousness of the circumstances of their birth. The use of multiple personas in reality as well as in the palaces is also reminiscent of Loki's frequent shapeshifting to suit his needs. Akechi uses cloak and dagger tactics to enact a plan decades in the making, but thankfully he is thwarted by the main cast and redeemed. Let's just hope there's no Ragnarok incoming for Persona 5's cast. Loki's design in Persona 5 is very unique, nothing like the usual artistic depictions of Loki. He has a sleek, monochrome pattern across his body with curved horns and hooves, most likely in reference to his shape-shifting nature. Loki also has red braids that taper off into a fire-like pattern, referencing Loki's frequently being attributed to a god of fire. A simple yet very expressive design. Last but not least, Sumere, the elegant introvert. Her persona is Cendrillon. Cendrillon is the French translation of Cinderella and the most famous depiction of the old European folktale of the same name. The version we all know and love published in 1697 by Charles Perrault. Though the tale is said to be much older than that being passed down by oral tradition. Now I'm sure you all know the story of Cinderella, but in case you don't, I'll summarize it. Cinderella is a kind and beautiful young woman forced to be a maid for her oppressive stepmother and cruel stepsisters. Word is eventually received that the kingdom's prince is holding a ball to search for a bride. But Cinderella's family forbids her from attending as she is nothing but a maid. Eventually, a fairy godmother appears and grants Cinderella's wish of attending the ball by loaning her a dress only until midnight. Come the night of the ball, the prince is smitten with her, but she is forced to return home before her clothes disappear, but leaves behind one glass slipper which is something maids have, I guess. The prince finds the slipper and somewhat obsessively forces every woman he sees to try it on, probably making them very uncomfortable in the process. But then he eventually finds Cinderella. The prince marries her and they live happily ever after, 
So sweet it almost makes you sick. Now for Sumire, she's a very polite and easily flustered girl. While she is shy in conversation, she's an extremely capable gymnast. And like Cinderella, there is an aspect of familial strain in Sumire's life with her sister and father. She suffers from a severe inferiority complex, which after her sister's passing is compounded with survivor's guilt. Both characters have poor opinions of themselves despite their obviously positive attributes. Sumire doesn't have to get her Prince Charming in the end, as her glass slipper was the Phantom Thieves outfit leading to her self-betterment. What if the real Prince Charming was the friends we made along the way? Cendralon's design has an obvious glass motif in reference to the glass slipper, with a flowing white cape most likely symbolizing the dress. Her hair is tied up in buns, akin to the depiction of Cinderella in the Disney film, tied up with a blue bow more reminiscent of her time as a maid. The gold, inset with blue glass on her waist, gives a more royal castle-like feel. A simple yet pleasant design. Well, that covers all the Phantom Thieves. This video was a real doozy to make. Leave a comment letting me know who your favorite Phantom Thieves persona is. I am genuinely curious to see what you guys have to say. I think if I had to choose, I'd pick Carmen. Her novella was great, her section of the script was just so much fun to research. Huge thanks and shout out to David Cast, whose channel link will be in the pinned comment below. Every episode of this series will have a guest on it, so stay tuned to find out who's on next. If you liked the video, leave it a like. If you really liked it, subscribe. And I'll see you in the next Tony for You. Have a good one.